Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Welcome once again to another episode in Dawawise. As you all know, at Dawawise, our goal is to educate, to inform, and inspire you. So that you may be balanced and articulate in your interactions during interfaith discussions. Our aim is to make you aware that we can help build bridges and improve interfaith understanding. And this is in our common interest to do so. Now, why is that? Because building bridges through interfaith discussions and dialogues is imperative to our future. Today's generations will be tomorrow's leaders. Therefore, it's critical that we focus on constructive, amicable dialogue to remove stereotypes, misrepresentations, caricatures, and mistrust. We must make the leaders we desire Otherwise, others will make desirable ones for us. To understand a religion, faith, or any way of life, the correct approach is to learn from the adherents, a pious follower of the faith. For instance, do you think it would be wise to learn Islam from a Christian or a Jew? Of course not. So with that in mind, today's session is an introduction to Hinduism, or otherwise appropriately and correctly known as Shanatan Dharma. And we are very pleased to welcome Mr. Dogra. Mr. Dogra is a retired Director General of Police and Director of Vigilance and Anti-Corruption on attaining the age of 60. And after three decades of distinguished service, I am, uh, he is recipient of President's Medal for Meritorious Service and Pre President's Medal for Distinguished Service. He has an academic training in linguistics, specializing in English, and taught English literature before joining the police force. He's fluent in Tamil and Punjabi and has deep knowledge of Sanskrit and Hindu traditions. He's currently a senior consultant in a law firm, an author, musician, painter, and meditation expert. Welcome, Mr. Dogra. How are you? Can you hear me, Mr. Yeah, Dogra? I'm very fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, nice I can to hear have you clearly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on board on our Dawawise channel. Um, and assalamu alaikum to my co panelists, uh, Ustad Hashim and Ustad Muhammad. Wa alaikum salam, Brother Mansoor. Yeah, how are you? Great to have you. Man. Hello, Mr. Dogra. How are you? Great to see you. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you indeed again to uh, all of you, uh, and especially our guest, uh, Mr. Dogra. Before we actually go into the introduction that which you will be presenting to us about Sanatan Dharma uh, and to make um, move on to the questions that we'll be asking you based on this to clarify some of the things that you may have said. Can you just help us to understand, you know, our audience, of course, why our audience should listen to you? Uh, is this a, a faith that you followed from the very beginning and from your childhood? Were you born into this? Um, um, is this a way of life that you have followed? from the very beginning, or something that you came to adhere and, and, and be following off from a later point of life? Go ahead. Yeah, I was, born, I was born a Hindu, and I have been a Hindu all along. It has been my religion and remains my religion. There have been, of course, changes in the faith in the sense that as I grew up, my faith became more and more mature and uh, I began to understand certain things that I could not understand earlier. And uh, there are particularly two religious books have, which have become the pillars of my life. One is Srimad Bhagavad Gita, which is Bhagavan Krishna's uh, uh, Upadesh, as we call it, that is his sermon to Arjun. And uh, the other is uh, Yoga Sutra by Patanjali, Rishi Patanjali. So from Srimad Bhagavad Gita, I have learned what we call Karma Yoga. That is the importance of doing your karma or your duty, your assigned duty sincerely and with God in your mind, with faith in your mind. And from Patanjali Yuga Sutras, I have learned techniques of meditation which have helped to uh, make me a better person, a more effective person. They have helped me to 
maintain my hold over things and uh, it has helped me in a number of ways so to answer your question yes this has been my religion all my life yeah thank you very much indeed for that um that was really helpful um, so shall we just go into the main portion of today's program, which is uh, going to be an introduction from yourself about Sunatana Dharma. And following that, we will ask you some questions um, to clarify some of the things. And obviously there will be some Q&A at the end from our audience, so please um, you know, stay tuned. So Mr. Dogra, it's all yours. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Now, I must start by saying that uh, I feel very happy to join you because it's a great effort to bring religions together. And we are living in the 21st century when more and more there is going to be mingling of faiths. And within the same faith, there are going to be multiple complexions of a faith because as the thinking tradition develops and uh, freedom of thought becomes more and more spread out, people are going to have their differences even about their own faith. So we do need to learn to appreciate each other and to live together and be more tolerant and more accepting of differences. So I appreciate your effort and I thank you for inviting me today. Uh, I believe a majority of the audience is Muslim. And this is not the first time I am interacting with Muslims. My job brought me in touch with Muslims in a number of ways. I fought with them and I fought for them both ways. And uh, I attended a number of functions which were organized in mosques or were organized by uh, Muslim organizations in schools, colleges, etc. And as you know, in India, we have a system of Mushaira, that is Urdu poetry, where a large number of people are Muslims also. So I have attended a number of Mushairas like that. So I have attended a number of functions, interacted with Muslims. I have a number of friends, very close friends who are Muslims. But this is the first time I'm talking to a majorly Muslim audience on Hinduism. Earlier, whenever I attended functions, I became one of them. So today I'm talking of my own religion. So I will try to be very faithful to my religion. And whatever I say has no implications, hidden, obvious, or in any way against any other religion. So. I'm not going to say anything which has any other implications. I'm simply going to tell about my religion. Now, coming to Hinduism, as everybody knows, this is the oldest religion. It has been around for thousands of years. And it has even given out some branches. And even today, there are a number of sects which keep arising from Hinduism. So. When there is a religion which is so variegated, it is not easy to sum it up in just a few words. So I'll be focusing on the essentials rather than the details. Now, first, I would like to start by saying that there are four beliefs which are most fundamental to Hinduism. And these beliefs have also being taken over by those branches which have arisen out of Hinduism, like Buddhism, Jainism, etc. Now, what are these four beliefs? First is the belief that each one of us is a soul which is trapped in a cycle of births and deaths. So, according to Hinduism, we have had millions of births and millions of deaths so these births and deaths included even birth as other animals, other creatures, like somebody who is a human being today could have been a lion or a frog or a lizard in his previous birth. So 
there are rebirths according to this is one of the most fundamental beliefs then related to this is that if we are trapped in a cycle of births and deaths then should we get out of it and uh, what would be the result of our getting out of it so according to this belief our aim is to get out of this cycle of births and deaths and when we get out of it we merge with the supreme soul so uh, now we are atma what we call as soul that is we call it as atma and there is a paramatma or the supreme soul so the final destination of each soul is the paramatma the final goal is to merge with the paramatma and when that takes place then we get moksha or salvation and that salvation then results in the stopping of our births and deaths we get out of that cycle so this is the second fundamental belief third belief is related to this the question is if we have to get out of this trap of births and deaths how do we do that and the answer would be we get out of this cycle through our actions so good actions and bad actions create what we may call as a kind of spiritual bank balance so if we keep increasing our spiritual bank balance by way of good acts then we can get out of this cycle but if we keep it decreasing our spiritual bank balance we make it more and more negative through bad actions then we may be born in our next birth as a lower creature instead of being born as a human being so this is the theory of karma where our actions become very fundamentally important then comes dharma dharma is the universal moral code so the question is if good acts have to be done then how do we define good acts so acts are defined as good according to the universal moral code called dharma so dharma is different from the moral code defined by human beings because that is where the word sanatan comes the title of this talk itself is sanatan sanatan dharma so sanatan means that which is everywhere and at every time it is everlasting it is it is ever existent more, more appropriately to say so this dharma sanatan dharma is a part of the fiber of creation it's a part of creation itself so sanatan dharma defines whether an act is good or bad so according to this for example killing an innocent person was a sin 2000 years ago it is a sin today it will sin it will remain a sin 2000 years from now it is a sin in one country it is a sin in another country also so it doesn't change according to time and space because it is a part of the fiber of creation so these are the four fundamental beliefs that hinduism has so this is where the uh, concept of dharma comes where dharma decides what is a good act and what is a bad act and since it is sanatan since it is applicable everywhere so it doesn't have anything to do with religion as we know it so dharma although it is often translated as religion is not religion because it's not a set of faiths it is not a set of beliefs it is a moral code which would be applicable to everybody so according to a hindu for example any person who believes in any religion and calls himself by any name could be following dharma by following this moral code so this is where dharma comes in then the importance of dharma of course would be clear from this now the other uh, uh, aspect of you know one question which could be raised is usually in any religion 
God is very important. So the question then is, you know, where is God? Does God have any importance in Hinduism or in Sanatana Dharma? So in Hinduism, God is a part of us. Since we are, since soul and that is Atma and Paramatma are just two, let's say, complementary things. So God is within us. That's why we say Aham Brahmasmi. Aham Brahmasmi means I am Brahma. I am myself and I have myself the divine element in, my, in myself. So that is why we Hindus believe that every individual is capable of attaining divinity. And that divinity is possible for any person of any religion because uh, Hinduism does not make a distinction between a person who claims to be from one religion or from another religion because the basic principles are the same for everybody. For example, everybody is basically divine. So that divinity is hidden because of certain preoccupations in the world. But when we follow dharma, when we cleanse our soul, then irrespective of whichever religion we practice or uh, proclaim, we can attain divinity in the same manner. There is another concept which is related to this. That is a distinction between Prakriti and Purushaha. The distinction is this physical nature is Prakriti and it works by its own rules. Purushaha is the spiritual domain. So when we are born, we have a body that is a part of Prakriti or the physical nature. But it has a divine element in it. Like uh, in Yoga Sutras, Maharshi Patanjali, first sutra is Yoga Chittavritti Nirodaha. Then he says, Tada Drashtuhu Swarupi Avasthanam. So that Drashtuhu is the seer within us. He is the divine element. So because of the vrittis that remains covered, but once those vrittis are controlled, when those vrittis are, there is a Nirodaha as he calls it then that divine element comes into its own form. So according to that, God is with us. We don't have to go to him or we don't have to seek him. He is very much a part of us. One more concept which is very important to understand is the concept of Jnana as we call it. That is, we may say knowledge with capital K. Now, what we believe in Hindu Hinduism is that what we call as knowledge, that is knowledge that is uh, gathered through senses and through logic is actually specious. It is not true knowledge because our senses and our logic were designed to uh, help us survive in a certain type of environment. So, for example, our eyes are designed in such a way that we see things only to the extent and in a man. Hello? Hello? We can You're hear fine. you. Can hear. Right You're here. perfectly fine. Right. Carry on. I, yeah. yeah, I think some, uh, some ad is coming. Uh, not this oh. side. That may be on your side. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. I don't know whether there was any interruption. No, there's no interruption for us. Okay. Please carry on. It's very interesting. Carry on. If you're watching from a YouTube stream, I mean, just playing YouTube, you can close that one and just focus on the stream yard um, the link that no, I've joined. I'm, yeah. I'm not watching the stream but uh, that's okay, okay. There, there has been no disturbance so you, you may carry on hmm? 
Yeah. There might be another tab open with YouTube on it. So if you can perhaps close that down, you shouldn't be disturbed after that, inshallah. Uh, OK, one minute, one minute. One minute. Yeah. yeah. Is it OK now? Yeah. It's fine. But if there is somebody oh, else okay. listening, okay. could you ask them to, okay. to move okay. on? OK, OK. Yeah. Please switch off. Yeah, I think that might be the reason. You know, actually, what started happening, I don't know where uh, my communication uh, got disrupted. Anyway, I'll try to recap. I was talking about jnana, the yes. knowledge, yes, yeah, knowledge through the senses and logic, and knowledge through uh, another mechanism which we believe is there with us. So the there are limitations on the knowledge that we can get through the senses. Yeah, like you know, for example, uh, now I'm sitting here. There is a lot of air in front of me, but I cannot see that air because my eyes have been designed by nature in such a way that I should not see the air particles. If I could see them, then I would not be able to see people. Similarly, now you are looking at my image on your screen. But actually what is happening is there are millions and billions of electrons coming and hitting the screen. We are not seeing those electrons. So our eyes are designed in such a way that they don't show us the truth. They show us what is useful for us for living in this world, for surviving in this world. So this is where it becomes impossible to know the ultimate truth through the senses. So how do we know the truth? That is where there is a, a part of us known as pragnya. So it is that pragnya, which is Ritambhara actually it is called. So Maharshi uh, Patanjali says, Ritambhara Tatra Pragnya. That is when a person is able to uh, activate his Ritambhara he is able to directly perceive the truth and that is the real truth because otherwise whatever we call truth is not the truth. For example, I say the road is uh, the rose is red, but the concept of red is a human concept. Actually, what is happening is there is a certain type of impulses which are entering our eye. They are producing certain type of reactions in the brain, chemical reactions, neural reactions, and we say it is red. But there is no such thing as red. It's only defined by human beings. So the ultimate truth is not known through the senses and the uh, log and logic. So that is where there are, that, that is where uh, this samadhi, what we call as meditation generally, is a mechanism for knowing all this. And this is where, you know, another uh, thing that happens is, that many of these concepts get distorted because we try to understand them through English. Now, meditation is not the same thing as Samadhi as described in Yoga Sutras. So it puts a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of limitations on understanding this. Now, uh, one more thing that I would say is that now if soul is there and the soul has to get out of the trap of births and deaths and it has to prepare itself for that then naturally the focus shifts to the individual so according to hinduism each one of us is carrying out our journey towards moksha so in that journey we have been uh, provided a lot of uh, guidance by the scriptures, by the gurus, and there are methods, techniques, and all that. So focus is on doing certain things to improve our existence in such a way that we move in that direction. What are those yoga is there, for example, then there is a basically, you know, that's why they say that Hinduism is a way of life. So you have to follow a way of life which, for example, gives you good health because if your health is not good, you cannot do your karma. You have to maintain mental cleanliness because if your mind is not clean, then how will God live in your brain, in your mind? Because he, this is his 
uh, nivas sthalam as we say that is the place of abode of god so if you are keeping your mind dirty then you are not providing a proper type of place to god so there are this type of practices in hinduism so uh, focus is on the individual and on his growth as a person and is following a certain path to towards moksha that is the overall framework but there are lots of things which come from all this so now uh, i don't know what is your uh, time plan if you think i have taken enough time then i think we can go to the next part of the program or otherwise if you want i can go into more details yeah i think it'll be good if we ask a few question based on what you sure. already sure, sure. discussed sure. so i think sure. one of the main questions that's uh, on my mind i'm pretty sure on the minds of the viewers as well is when you said the atma the soul uh, the eventual sorry the um, the ultimate goal is for the atma to become one with the paramatma the the supreme soul or supreme divine uh, mm -hmm. being if if you want to call that is is that the brahman you're talking about the one supreme god brahma yes brahma okay there are two so, different there are two different words one is brahmin brahmin is different brahma is different brahma is the entire uh, uh, you know cosmos plus god and everything yeah okay right so the question based on that would be like you know in islamic theology we believe that the creator uh, allah who is the the god in his in islam he is the one who is distinct from his creation so the creation is obviously something that he brought into existence it didn't exist before so do you have a similar concept in hinduism that other than the brahman uh, the supreme god was everything created including the souls that you have and the, the people have was that all a creation of god and if that is a the case then how do you perceive the what do you say the, the creation becoming one with the creator yeah see what happens is you know one thing is that uh, uh, there are uh, different views about this there is a uh, uh there are two primarily two views one is dwait the other is advait dwait is that creation and creator are different you know hinduism as it is has grown over a long period and people have uh you know meditated and tried to know the truth so one school of uh hinduism says that there is a difference between that that a creator has a different uh, distinct uh, existence from creation that's known as dwait and the other is that creator and creation are the same that is advait so as a hindu i don't go into all these details for the reason that you know what happens is now i'll give you an example you see let's say there is a worker in a company now unless he is doing research on who is the owner of the company how he runs it and all that his focus is on doing his work that is where karma and dharma become important so as a person who is focusing on my karma according to my dharma i unless i am a researcher into theology and researcher into all these uh, subjects philosophy i don't have to bother about what is the nature of god and i go by a simple belief system which helps me to do my part of the job as i gave an example in that let's say i am the manager of a company now who is the owner where is he sitting how does he what does he eat what does he do i don't have to concern myself so long as it doesn't interfere with my work so that is what is the karma yoga theory you do your part of the job that's a huge system you know universe is very big in that big universe it is not for me to unravel the mystery of that uh, universe or you know try to understand when it's so mysterious when the the task given to me is you do your part of the job your karma that's how i would look at it if i could come in here so um 
So let's sort yeah. of take it back. Uh, um, let's sort of take it back right to the very beginning. And I think it's important to really understand. I think what dharma and karma is really all about. So what I'm getting from what you've described here, Mr. Dogra, is that Hinduism is more focused on discovering why do we exist? Why am I here? What is my purpose? By not philosophizing about the creator but saying well actually I, there is an el- in, in, in your understanding there is an element of god inside me so if i look inside myself and focus and meditate and concentrate inside myself then enlightenment will arrive to me in in in, in some manner it, so therefore there is no need for a god then in that case because your this search, this seeking that you're doing, which is your internal seeking, is the very essence of Hinduism. It, it, would that be a correct understanding of what you're describing? See, it depends upon you, because it's basically what is there, you know, it is your own individual choice, how you want to, uh, how do you want to do this? No, let, let me let me try to answer you. I have understood your question. The, the thing is that uh, it's a personal explore, exploration and I could, for example, you know, as a Hindu, at times there is a, let's say, a Muslim knot which gives me the religious experience. A church bell uh, ringing in a distance might give me a religious experience. My Hinduism doesn't tell me to deny that because Anything that brings me closer to God is enough for me. I don't have to label it as Hindu or this or this or this. So it's a it's an exploration and it's a search and it's a journey in which whatever helps me, I'm ready to take that. Now, the question of what is God's nature? What does he eat? What does he like? So. I do go through some of the scriptures, Vedas, for example, you know, where questions have been raised. A lot of, see, Hinduism raises a lot of questions because in Hinduism, we believe that truth is extremely complex. It is unknowable except through what I told, you know, through Samadhi and through awakening your divinity. Without doing that, you cannot know the truth. You may logically build conjectures. For example, now logically I may say that if there is a creation, there has to be a creator also. But when there are so many things which are not logically explainable, for example, infinity is not logically explainable. If infinity logically should not exist because everything that is there has to have an end. But there is existence of infinity. Now, this universe, when did it start? It started when? There has to be a beginning. When will it end? There has to be an end. So the world as we know it has certain traits which are defined by truth as we know it logically also. So when that kind of complexity exists, there could be certain types of complexities which it is not possible for me with my limited uh, logic and senses etc to understand so i have two choices one choice for me is to become a seeker after truth and a seeker after god and dedicate myself to that that's not my aim my aim is to live my life according to certain principles and that is where an overall faith, which gives me a framework and makes my mind peaceful. It doesn't make me something hang- hanging in a vacuum. That much of faith is enough for me. So I don't have to go deeper into that. Now, you know, that, that should answer your question, it, whether no, it is relevant it, or not relevant. You know, for me, what I would say is God becomes relevant at times. And he, he remains irrelevant in many of the times. For example, when I'm working on my laptop on something, I don't have to keep remembering God. At the same time, in the morning when I take bath, I go and stand in front of 
the temple in my house at that time god becomes relevant because then i am connecting with god drawing upon his power gaining confidence so that is when he becomes relevant but he doesn't have to, i don't have to carry him with me in my mind all the 24 hours of the day nor do i have to do research about him because that's not the aim of my life i am not dedicating myself to that job got it Be- beautiful answer Th- thank you so much for that so the 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 obviously the 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 follow on question then from this because you did mention it in the introduction is there are obviously sacred texts of hinduism yeah you said that there are enlightened beings or people that you who would discover some of this through their own meditations i believe you refer to them as rishis yeah. in in your, in your history Thank so you. so how do those interplay with each other i mean i mean is it the rishi that really discovers the text or is the is it because he reads the texts and then he's allowed to more deeply meditate and therefore come closer what is that interaction and and how does it how does it work itself out yeah see what happens is you know scriptures are basically meant to guide us we are going on a path now when you are going on a path you need to know which side leads you to your goal so scripture will show you the direction the guru will show you the direction but they are not going to carry you on your shoulder on their shoulders see it's the same story that you take a horse to the water but it is the horse which has to drink water there is a, a shloka which says that to a person who doesn't have discretion scriptures are useless they are like the mirror to a blind man the meaning is you know mirror is supposed to show you your image but if you cannot see then how will the mirror show you your image so first you must develop discretion focus in hinduism is on developing your own thinking power your own growth exploration and uh, any type of blind faith is not uh, it doesn't accord with hinduism so there is for example you know there was one saint by name swami ramakrishna paramahans and he used to say that if there is a contradiction between a scripture and the truth as it appears to your eyes then throw away the scripture and believe your eyes similarly you know there is in shrimad bhagavad gita bhagwan shri krishna says na sato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sata ubhay rupi drishto antastane ustat darshi bhi so what he says is untruth never is truth never isn't so if you believe in untruth in spite of the fact that the facts contradict that then it is your mistake because untruth is not going to become truth just because you believe in it you know there was a time when people thought the sun is going around this earth but at that time also it's the earth that was going around the sun so we have to give priority to truth so if there is something in the scriptures which contradicts obvious truth then i as a hindu would say that that part of the scripture should be ignored so scriptures are not in hinduism scriptures are not meant to be followed in toto they are a guide they because basically the exploration is my exploration it's a personal exploration if i am very dedicated i may be able to find the truth even without much help so this is where the scriptures etc come but then like you know you may be very intelligent you may be einstein but still you have, you need some t- uh, teachers to put you on the right path so similarly there are gurus there have been rishis i have for example learned a lot from uh, maharshi patanjali's yoga sutras as i told you he his teachings have transformed my life completely and they have been of great use to me in developing my mind and my faculties does that answer uh, of course i mean i mean look uh, i think this is uh, a beautiful insight to something that has been uh, not well understood at least outside of of uh, the observations that we've made and i think you know some of the common misconceptions for example that, that I'd like to address maybe in the next question then but the mansuri can come in is we hear often that there is this idea of a 
Vedantic source to a lot of the the Hindu understanding, and, and as you said, the the various offshoots of Jainism, Sikhism, uh, Buddhism, even um, the, they're they're quite broad in the in the sense that Buddhism, for example, is almost atheistic. A, 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 there is no concept of God in Buddhism, whereas at least in in what I would call classic Hinduism, there is an idea of a of of this being of this this sort of eternal being and therefore this eternal truth so how can it be that if the vedas or the vedantic origins are the same that they result in this um variety of almost theistic to atheistic continuum in understanding and yet it's all considered part of the same okay if you studied the vedas you would find that uh, a lot of the vedic hymns are uh, especially rig veda you know mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the vedic uh, shlokas raise questions so one of the common uh, words in vedas it is neti 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 that is god is not this not even this not even this so vedas present god as extremely complex and that is where you know uh, you know, again, this is no reflection on anyone else. I'm only talking mm -hmm. about my religion. Sure, sure, sure. That uh, uh, Hinduism, you know, even 2000, 3000 years ago, Hindu rishis have said what is in accordance with science today. For example, you know, the other day I was reading one shloka from Srimad Bhagavat Quran, where uh, the shloka says, it's a very, you know, it's all very beautiful poetry. If you read it, you would be fascinated by the poetry part of it, if nothing else. So what that shloka says is, he says, how can I even imagine you, I who am just the length of seven spans of my hand, and you are so great that universes can pass through the pores of your body like dust particles passing through the curtain in a window. So this is a shloka given there. So at that time, you know, the dimensions of the universe at a time when nobody had known all this and when in some other countries people were talking about, you know, uh, the sun going around the earth or the earth being a plate in water and all that. So during those times, if this kind of writing has been done, I would say that this was some vision through meditation and through <clears throat> the awakening of their mind, which I find very attractive. Interesting concept. Now, your question of uh, Vedas, I think, is still not answered. That is whether, whether Vedas are basic or not. Not. Yeah, of course, no. Vedas are basic to all these uh, religions. Now, the question is, why did uh, Buddhism deviate from classical Hinduism? Why did Jainism deviate from that? So yes. what happens, you know, for that, you'll have to go into historical details. For example, uh, there are historians who have told how certain social distortions took place. And uh, because of that, then Buddha had to uh, act in, an, in a manner which took it away from the Brahmins. So there was a domination of the Brahmins. So that you'll have to go to history and study. You know, this. That if I go into those details, it will take a long time. But basically what happens is in a religion which is basically uh, based on exploration and uh, trying to find the truth in your own way, which is not prescriptive, so to say, there is always a possibility of various branches arising. So I don't think they turned their uh, eyes on the Vedas. What they were doing was they were giving simpler ways. For example, Buddha was giving a simpler way of attaining moksha and uh, Jain uh, Munis also, they were also. So it's not that they rejected the tradition of Vedas. Vedas have always been taken to be fundamental to Hinduism. That would be my belief. Okay, fair enough. That's fine. Uh, we, we can delve into this deeper another conversation, but I think that's enough for now. Uh, Brother Mansoor, do you, do you yeah, have any thank questions? You. Um, 
I think just for a clarification again, because, because the concept of God seems to be quite a different um, in the way the angle that you're explaining from the traditional understanding of God in Abrahamic faith. We, as uh, Ustad Hashim explained earlier on, we have a concept where God is distinct, creator is distinct from the creation, and the concept of God is someone who is you know, absolute, someone who is one, and you can't divide uh, this creator into parts or into you know different you know appendages and so on and so forth. Just like how people explain, there's a sun and there's this rays coming up from the sun and it's all part of it. Um, in Abrahamic faith, God is totally unlike any of these things. God is unique in in his uniqueness, and everything else is unlike. Um, within the Sanatan Dharma, of course, when we read the Vedas or the Upanishads. The Puranas, or you know, you know, Gita, Mahabharata, and all the stories, you seem to be experiencing a concept of God which is quite flexible in the understanding. And often, there are this understanding of gods and goddesses and semi-gods and demigods, whatever you want to call them, uh, gods and avatars. Just to explain to our audience, you know, when you say Paramatma and everything else, the Atman just trying to, you know, save, you know, somehow un unleash from their bodies that they're occupying and mixing with this uh, Paramatma. What's the relationship with this Paramatma and all the other divine entities or beings in, when, when they're called gods and goddesses? Yeah. I mean, do you have multiple gods, each equal and valid? Just want to clarify the very yeah. concept of God that you okay. have. I think variety of concept is what is uh, maybe a confusion in people's minds. It's, it's getting it's getting slightly uh, disrupted, at, uh, you know, in my screen. I don't know whether your uh, screen is getting it, but you are getting my communication now. It's yes, perfectly clear. fine. Yes, yes, clear. Are you getting me? Yes, yes, yes we are. Oh, I think he has communication. Yeah. Are you getting me? Well, we are getting you. I think you're probably yeah, having yeah. a broadband issue there. Yeah, yes. Okay. 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 Maybe you know because this is this may be the time when more and more people are logging in, so that we try to explain. Let Do you want Mansoor to, to repeat the question? See, or what did happens, you... uh, Mansoor? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, is it okay now? Yeah. Yeah. We Go can ahead. hear Hello. you still. Carry you, on. Please. Yeah. Please carry on. Yeah, yeah, you can hear. Okay. See what happens. You know, there is uh, there is there is one uh, Upanishad. Hello. Yeah, carry on. Yeah, we can yeah, hear you. Your screen may be frozen, but we yeah, can actually it's hear it's audio as you speak. Yeah, the audio is good. Yeah. The, the audio is fine. Your screen may okay. freeze, but your audio I'll is keep, fine. I'll keep, I'll keep Actually, you know, you are disappearing from the screen. Doesn't matter. I'll just continue. So, what happens? You know, there is an Upanishad called Isha Vasya Upanishad, and the first shloka of that Isha Vasya Upanishad is Isha Vasyam Sarvamidam Yat Kimch Jagatyam Jagat. So, he says everything is the abode of God, and there are other shlokas also. Where it is said that uh, there is, for example, one shloka I was reading the other day, I don't remember it now, but there it is said that uh, if you want to feel my presence, just look around and you'll be able to feel me. So hmm. the concept of God being everywhere is there. Now, coming to multiple gods, that's one of your questions. And second question is that uh, Bhagwan Ram, Bhagwan Krishna, so how is it that they are everywhere and then, then there are also human beings? So again, you know, there are a few things that I'd like to say. One is that uh, uh, so far as multiple gods are concerned, you know, I again, as a Hindu, I have not been spending much of my mental energy on that because I am not a, a researcher on this. So for me, it's enough as a faith system of faith. So if I go, let's say there is a god called Hanuman, you would have seen and heard of Hanumanji, yes. you know. So yes. I go stand in front of him. For that moment, I take him to be Hanuman. I draw energy from him. 
maybe that energy comes from the universe from somewhere i do not know but it helps me so he is important to me as a symbol whether he exists existed doesn't matter to me so long as it is giving me energy and so so long as it is giving me strength now coming to millions of uh, gods and goddesses you know if there can be millions of planets and millions of universes there can as well be millions of gods and goddesses also so theoretically we cannot deny that you know maybe gods and goddesses are supreme powers managers who are looking after all the universes how do we know so since i cannot since i cannot deny it i need not accept it also i just i just keep it as a part of my belief system and i say okay there are so many gods i love them i get power from them i am not doing research on them and my life does not in any way benefit by my contradicting or proving the existence of those gods and goddesses now coming to avatars bhagwan shri krishna bhagwan shri ram etc the concept of avatar is i talked about purushaha and prakriti see purushaha is the spiritual domain prakriti is the physical domain so what happens is that at times god that is the paramatma he can enter the prakriti domain in which case he will have to take a human form because in the prakriti domain you can only exist in the according to the rules of prakriti so that is where you know what happens is now when corona came you know people went to temples they went to mosques they went to churches and they said why is god not helping us that is because corona is a part of prakriti it is not a part of uh, purushaha so prakriti acts by its own rules so if corona is a part of if a corona uh, comes you have to handle it by uh, treating uh, yourself so prakriti is even for god also if he has to enter prakriti he has to become a human being and he becomes liable to all the weaknesses and all the other problems that human beings have so that is why you know some people raise the question if bhagwan was uh, if bhagwan ram is god then why did he have to go so much suffering that is because he was human so once you enter prakriti you are not uh, bringing your godhood there so this is the belief system and again i would come back to the same thing that as an educated 21st century man i don't spend much of my mental energy on these things for me bhagwan ram for example symbolizes a lot of things in my mind and when i think of him he integrates all those things and gives me power so for me that is enough it's like the it's like the national flag you know national flag is a piece of cloth but then national flag also has lot of significance for us because there are so many emotions that we have spent on it so same way bhagwan ram is somebody for whom i have spent a lot of my emotions from my days of childhood and therefore he makes a difference to me he is important for me i don't have to go into the details of whether he existed or what was he like and all that so that's how i look at it thank you very much for the yeah. answer thank you so one one of the main points i wanted to ask you was with regards to the scriptures you earlier uh, alluded to the fact that if your personal research about the truth is in conflict with the scripture then you give preference to your personal truth that you have discovered no, i didn't i didn't say personal experience i said truth as it obviously appears before me personal experience could be wrong also you know okay yes See, so personal experience, experience is subjective personal experience is subjective right but if there is reality right in front of me let us say that one scripture says that if you jump from a hill you'll be saved if you say so and so so and so so and so but i find people jumping and dying then there is a truth right in front of my eyes so i should not i should go by that truth that's what swami ramakrishna also said okay so is it possible that there are things about uh, 
your faith about not about the physical realm but about the spiritual realm which your scripture talks about yeah so is it possible that for one hindu they could understand the scripture in one way and another hindu understands the same scripture the same versus the same slokas uh, in a different way if there is such yeah. a conflict yes then how yeah. do you resolve it in hinduism or in sanatan dharma okay now the question is you know supposing there is an understanding of a certain scripture which is helping me and there is another interpretation and another understanding of the same scripture which is helping somebody else i don't see any conflict in that because as i said you know these are aids to us in our personal exploration so if i am benefited maybe we could sit across the table and i could share my understanding with him he shares his understanding with me and finally we find that each one of us is benefiting in our own way from our understanding of the scriptures i would say fine because ultimately life is important you know what is important is life and our exploration towards moksha that is important you know scriptures are only aids they are not the be all and the end all of uh, my life okay i mean what i was alluding to was basically you know in india there is um, what we normally call the caste system yes mm -hmm. so there are many uh, hindus out there who do not intermarry if they belong to a different caste yes maybe there are hindus who are probably have a different understanding of the same scriptures and they say they, they don't they don't put any they do not discriminate whom they get married to yeah regardless of the caste uh, regardless of the background they would marry anyone so you have this perhaps a modernist understanding uh, i don't know where you stand with this but there are many hindus who are i would say very traditional and they stick by the scripture so what the manusmriti would say with regards to uh the different uh, what do you say the different the four categories of the cl classification of the caste you know the brahma vishnu sorry the brahma uh the brahmins the brahmin, kshatriyas Shatri. the vedyas and yeah. the shudras yeah, let me so, let yeah. me answer let me answer on. yeah yeah the thing is you know manusmriti talks about varanashramaha not about jati there is a difference between the two varana means uh, your uh, style so to say actually varana means complexion complexion in the sense that what distinguishes you from others so there the distinction is in terms of the talents and the proclivities of different people for example one person is more oriented towards studies so he becomes a brahmin it's basically a division of labor very beautiful division of labor what happened was in course of time especially because of external aggression when people started feeling insecure about con conversion because conversion started taking place mm, a lot of time under force so they wanted to save the society against conversion so they started making the system rigid and that is when jati came jati the word jati comes from the word ja which means to be born so that is when the distinction started becoming a distinction by birth so this is a very unfortunate development which has taken place over the years and now gradually things are improving in fact uh, to share my personal information one of my daughters is married to a person of another caste so these things are becoming common now and caste is not as rigid as it used to be and hopefully these things will disappear and i as a person would like to play my role in making these things disappear this is an unwanted curse of our society which has developed because of many historical reasons you know if we have to go into all those details then we would need a lot of discussion okay but manusmriti manusmriti does not uh, it talks about varanashrama yeah all right so so you have uh, the costs based on the birth and you have a different varanas or the classification based on your division of labor there are two different things is that what you say yeah yeah that's what it was and now it has become jati the word jati does not exist in the older scriptures because jati is from the word ja as i told you know ja is to be born so 
jati is determined by your birth you are born in a particular family so that becomes your jati but that word is not used in uh, scriptures for example shrimad bhagavad gita talks about varan ashram manusmriti talks about varan ashram so varan is a division varana means basically a division and varan ashram is division of society it's a kind of you know division of labor and which worked very well in during those days see for example you know if people of a certain profession are cert- given certain types of advantages then they are able to do it better that's what is what is happening even today in modern society okay so yeah that's how it has to be seen so yeah. if i could come in here brother hashim so yeah sure so this this raises a very interesting question because one of the questions that often comes up with all scriptures um is this idea of if it is revealed scripture which is how the abrahamic faiths consider their scripture and especially islam then revealed scripture means that it's unquestionable because god gave it to you and you know nobody can question god right so whatever god gave is right and whatever god didn't give is is not right now based on what you're saying then you're saying the scripture is quite flexible in hinduism in the in that you can choose to ignore parts of it if you feel that your current understanding or current reality is against it right so so is there any idea of any scripture being um non sort of th- that cannot be abrogated is is there, is there such a concept in hinduism or can any scripture be abrogated if you believe today 22nd century 23rd century means that yeah. you should abrogate it yeah i'll tell you uh see shrimad bhagavad gita is bhagwan krishna's upadesha sarman and bhagwan krishna is believed to be one of the purna sampurna avatar that is complete incarnation of bhagwan vishnu right. in shrimad bhagavad gita when bhagwan shri krishna gives his sermon to arjun at the end of the sermon bhagwan shri krishna says i have told you the entire truth now based on your own understanding you take your own decision so he doesn't say i have told you this now follow it so the decision that's where you know there is one very popular shloka ha karmani eva adhikaraste mahapaleshu kadachana so karmani eva adhikaraste means the your uh, right is restricted only to what you shall do so in a way you know more indirectly what is said is that what you shall do is your right that is free will complete free will so even god cannot say you must do this and not this that is your right then of course the next part says ma paleshu kadachan that is the result of that action cannot be decided by you and that is because the result will be decided by so many interaction of so many other actions done by so many other people you know for example let's say a person shoots somebody but a bird comes in between and receives that shot so the person is not shot so this person's action does not get his intended result the result is because of the interaction of multiple actions done by multiple people but what you shall do is your right that's what bhagwan shri krishna says so in hinduism your choice your decision because it's your karmas that you are going to do you know it's not somebody else's karmas that you are doing it's an individual doing his karma so he has to decide what he should do the others can only guide they can say if you do this this will be the result if you do this this will be the result but they cannot catch his hand and say do like this so that is where what you say what you say is uh, partially correct that scriptures can be modified ignored or whatever it's up to the individual because individual is the field of action field of decision making yeah so without without being disrespectful i think if i could summarize i, I don't mean to be i think you see in in the abrahamic faiths we have the idea of a of a personal god you know we relate to god individually we relate to god directly we relate to god based on his revelation and we follow that revelation 
what I'm hearing from your summary is actually you have the idea of a personal religion, let me call it, because your way is your way, and it's not somebody else's way. And if you decide by reading your scriptures that your understanding leads you to a particular direction, then nobody can disagree with you, because it, it's your it, it's your um, insight that is taking you there. Hmm. Yeah. See, what happens is nobody can force me, or nobody is nobody can prescribe because this is my decision, and I am. You know, when you talk of your relating to your God, that is exactly what I am also doing. I am also relating to my God only. You know, I am not. Uh, uh, doing anything else. The same thing that you are telling. Now, I don't want to comment on other religions, what is their uh, style, but in Hinduism, for example, you know, now I, let's say that uh, I get up in the morning, I stand in front of my temple. I That's when I'm relating to my God in a method which I have been taught by my parents, which I have absorbed from so many other sources. So, the question of differences does not generally arise because there are some accepted common ways which all of us are following. You know that's why we are called Hindus. Mm. You know, if we were follow, if we were following different ways, then uh, let's say there is a temple. So thousands of people, millions of people go there. They pray in the same manner. They relate to God in the same manner. They relate to the same God. So. Your question is not, uh, you know, the type of distinction that you are trying to draw is not very clear. In what way do you think my uh, connecting with my God, my relating to my God would be different from, let's say, your uh, way of relating to your God? How would it be different? Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's an interesting question. So you see, um, Islamically, or uh, really the Abrahamic faith in, in general at a broad level, um, we relate to God via revelation mm. and revelation tells us how to have a relationship with this one singular entity transcendent reality that is the creator of all existence mm. and we are clearly told in revelation that the creation is not like the creator and the creator is not like the creation so anything we do here we do based on his laws and commands and he's prescribed to us that look this is how you this is how you must understand. He's revealed, for example, we have a um, um, a surah in in the Quran, which surah Ikhlas, which says, which 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 God describes who He is. He says, "Qul huwa Allah ahad, Allah samad, lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad." And basically, it says, "I, Qul huwa Allah ahad, He is one and only. Allah samad, He is nothing. He is is the sustainer. He needs nothing." Is is not um, is not in need of anything. Lam yalid wa yulad. He is not born. He is not begotten. And there is nothing in creation that is like him. And this is a four line summary that has been revealed to us of what God is and what God is not. That's it. So this is this is where we take our definition from, and so we relate to God in that way. Which means every Muslim relates to God in that way. I can't now take this and say you know. I don't think God meant when he says he's not born, he's not begotten, that he's sometimes born and he's sometimes not born. You see, I can't do that because Revelation tells me it's clear. That's what I mean. So in when I say personal, we have a personal relationship directly based on Revelation. And I have no way now to reinterpret that in any other way. The difference that I'm saying here is it sounds like, from what you're yeah. saying, that in Hinduism, if you... First of all, the scripture you said earlier on is is based on deep meditation that the rishis arrived at. And and you're saying, from what I understood, that different rishis could arrive at different um, uh, interpretations, let's say, or different insights. Which means now you have the ability that if you meditate enough and you become an enlightened person, you could say, you know, actually, I have, I've had a I have a different insight now. You know, 2,000 years, 3,000 years later, I've arrived at a different reality. I've arrived at a different reality. Therefore, I'm going to take it different. Which means, you see, in Islam, somebody that was studying Islam, somebody that was worshipping um, in the way that Islam was presented 1400 years ago, 
you know, the way we do salah, the way we fast, the way we pray, the way we worship is exactly the same that we do today. Because these are revealed foundations. We can't change those. What we can change is the legal elements, what we call fiqh. So, you know, to do with day-to-day -day life. So, you know, you know, do I, you know, for example, they rode camels back in the day, okay? Does that mean I have to ride camels all the time now? No, I, I can use a car. And, and you know, this, this, this is a question of day-to-day -day legalities that we can draw um, an, an, an analogical thinking and so on, on to do. So this is not a question of worship. This is a question of living your life. So when I say, when you said earlier that Hinduism is really sort of, what you said is, not only can you change how you live as a Hindu, but your core tenet of the Hindu belief itself from the scripture can also be changed by you if you find that your insight doesn't disagree with it. That was a longer answer, but I hope that that sort of was clear to you. That's no, what I if meant. You'd, uh, if you'd like me to respond to it, I can. Uh, please do. If please go ahead. Do. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sure. See, how I would uh, respond to your uh, remark is one is that uh, uh, now you say that you relate to your God because of certain types of teaching or certain types of uh, uh, you know, scriptural, yeah, scriptural uh, apparatus, let's say, that you have. Now, the question is whether your relation to God, therefore, becomes of a qualitatively superior quality than my relationship to God. So that is where I would not uh, agree because my relationship to God is perfect so far as I am concerned. Now, whether it is through a particular type of text or without a text or from multiple texts or through my experience or whatever, I have a relationship with God which is perfect for me. It is working extremely well. Okay. Now, second thing that uh, I would say is that when you say that uh, a certain definition of Godhood, God has been given, that has been given in Hinduism also, and there are people who believe that also. It's up to a person whether he wants to believe in that in totality, or for example, you know, in Srimad Bhagavad Gita, there is a Virat Swarup, which is very specific, very, very detailed, and uh, it is there now. For a person like me, again, living in the 21st century, I make my choices and my religion permits me to make those choices. It doesn't say that even if there are certain things which your 21st century scientific mind is not accepting, you must accept it. So that is one difference which I would say exists. But let's not uh, make it a comparison because that's not the purpose of this uh, no, discussion. No, no, of course not. I, I, just, wanted to, I just wanted to draw yeah. out the, 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 was I understanding what you were saying? Was I? Because I don't want to misrepresent and I don't want to misunderstand what you were saying. So I was no, just trying my, to... My to understanding, my understanding, as I said, you know, my understanding is that, for example, you know, through meditation, I'm able to get into a state of being which is very different from the day-to-day -day state of being. So that is what I value very much. That's what I value. So for me, all those things which have been given to me, you no, know, I don't. Uh, I don't go by a very rigid type of uh, a system. But there are lots of things which I have imbibed, and I use them for various purposes to get close to God. To you know, for me, God is present everywhere. As I said, you know, Isha Vasam Sarvamidam. Mm -hmm. So I can feel his presence everywhere. I can feel his presence around me. So at times I do that also as meditation. I just close my eyes and feel the presence of God all around me. And it gives me a lot of uh, pleasure also, peace of mind. It gives me strength. It gives me health. So I have my own ways of uh, so i don't think we should say that uh, because uh, this system of faith is different therefore it is inferior or it is less effective i think both systems let them survive let the respective followers follow their religion i as a hindu for example 
would not try to pull a, a person of any other religion to my religion. You know, it is for him to decide. I won't like to do that because it is his choice. So for me, every person has his own personal uh, journey, which he should perform in his own way. That's how I would Got it. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's what I meant. I think each journey, uh, from what you're saying, everybody's journey is unique. I mean, under Hinduism, you know, so everybody's journey is unique. And as a as a, another Hindu, you don't have any sort of you don't have any right to say you're on the wrong path or the right path because his no, path is his path. It's not, it's not like that, you know. It's not that we don't discuss all these things, you know. For example, with my friends, I would share my experiences. I might express my doubts also. I would uh, tell them uh, how to shape their life. So all those things are there. It's not that. Uh, we cut ourselves off from others and just uh, only thing is that there is no uh, sort of compulsion on what is to be done. That's what I would say. Got it. Yeah, exactly. There is there is a freedom to make your own choice. But that doesn't mean that you cut ourselves, cut yourself off from others and simply say, no, no, I don't follow this. I don't bother about scriptures. I don't. Bother. It's not like that. You know, you it's you integrate things and then build yourself up because focus is on life focus is on life yeah yeah uh, no again and i think you know i mean look j just to step back for a second i think there is a, a great community in hinduism you know you have a lot of um um what i would call rituals that yes. involve yes. you know lots of people being involved and so on and so forth and and one yeah. of the thing and again so i'm not saying it's it's just individualistic and you do your own thing no 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 but what I am trying to draw out here is that, you see, unlike, and this is really for our audience, is it unlike Islam and unlike the Abrahamic faith where there is a, a revealed set of laws, a revealed set of rituals, a revealed set of understandings that we don't waver from, and there is a difference between the prescriptions of God's law to do with worship, which cannot be questioned, and then there is the prescriptions of of um life which is the legal rulings to 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 like jurisprudence to 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 manage your life according to that objective morality that has been revealed objectivity is key here there is a distinction between those two and all i was trying to say here is is i think that's quite for me anyway is it's challenging to draw that distinction in hinduism because it seems they're all part of the same search, the same seeking that you're doing, which is my morality, my day-to-day -day life, and my searching, it's all part of the same challenge because I want to achieve moksha. I want to escape from this reality at some point. But, and how I do it is by working well, doing good. And if I do enough good in this existence, then hopefully in the next one I get to a better existence and eventually yeah. I'm freed. Okay, let me let me let me say something which I think might uh, answer your question. Good. See, for example, you know, if there is a person uh, who has a choice between spending five hours in a temple or five hours doing good to other people, let us say, working in a hospital and uh, helping patients, etc., I would prefer that he spends. In most cases, I don't know. In a particular situation, his being in a temple for five hours may have some relevance. But generally, I would say that it would be better for him, as a Hindu, I would say, it would be better for him to spend those five hours serving people because that is his karma. So karma is mm -hmm. more important in uh, in our religion. Mm -hmm. Good karma is very important. And, you know, as a Hindu, I would prefer to associate with a person who calls himself Muslim and does very good acts than to associate with a person who calls himself Hindu and is a very bad fellow. So karma is very important yes. for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we, 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 we can definitely agree there. Right. We can yeah. definitely yeah. agree on that one for sure. Yeah. Yes. Just yeah. on this note of karma and dharma, um, I think our audience will also have a similar type of question. So I just want some clarification from you. Because the whole idea of moksha, you said, is you know, having this the relief from this cyclical 
uh, cycles of birth, birth and, and death. death. Yeah. And depending on your spiritual nature or spiritual position, of course, you can be born into a different lower form of creation. So do you consider Hinduism, there's two parts to my question, first of all, that human beings seem to be on an elevated form of creation. Yes, of course, and of course. Other forms yeah. of creation are a lower yeah. form. Fine. Yeah, so because, okay. because what is there? Let me answer. This is very important because in Hinduism, it is believed that since a human being alone is capable of judging his own actions and, perform, and dis, uh, drawing a distinction between dharma and adharma, therefore, human birth is given to a person to attain moksha. And if he wastes it, then it's a very unfortunate thing. So, so we, should, we, should, we should utilize this to attain moksha. That is the Hindu faith. Understood. So based on this understanding, if someone is born into other forms of uh, creation, like as you mentioned, something about frogs or other things, how does these um, forms of creation, um, non-human creation, then achieve to a higher spiritual state? Because they don't have the spiritual mechanisms within themselves, unlike ourselves, because we are, as you said, we are able to differentiate between what is dharma and karma and all this understanding through meditation, through different kind of understanding our path and the search for it. How do you expect animals, for example, without specifying any particular animals within the animal kingdom, how do they achieve uh, higher spiritual realms and understanding so that they can, in their future birth, become a human being or another form of creation which is higher? Okay, now uh, I would say that uh, I, I can of course answer this question based on whatever I've read in the scriptures, but I would say that I would not like to again spent my mental energy on all this you know my focus would be okay i have been given human birth there is a possibility that uh, the moksha theory is a correct theory so let me try to get out of this uh, cycle of births and deaths because now lots of scientific research is also proving that there is rebirth lots of research has been done and there are lots of in fact you know there was uh, when i was teaching in a university there was a muslim a researcher from Aligarh Muslim University who had done a lot of research in rebirth. So I would be focusing, you know, instead of my, instead of wasting my energy on all these things, I would be focusing on doing good acts and getting out of this cycle of karma. So there are so many issues one can keep raising, discussing, and you know, it's like uh, whipping up froth which is not going to lead us anywhere. The purpose basically is to make life better. And I have one request to make now. Uh, since, you know, I, as I told you, I sleep at uh, 10, 20, and it's already going to be 12 here. So can we begin to wind up now? Yes, I think yes, most, of, yes, of course. most of the issues we have discussed now, of course, you know, one can keep pulling things and uh, drawing out. Basically, the purpose is to understand the religion. And I have been as forthright as possible to explain my part of the religion. And my purpose is not to influence anyone. It's their choice. They have to decide what is good for them, what is bad for them. You know, I was at one time counseling people about spirituality and one person from America contacted me and he said, uh, I am now suffering from AIDS and I get terribly scared because uh, if I die now, then what will I be born like? He was, an, he was a Christian, he was an American and uh, he was not able to walk around. Yes. So then I taught him some meditation techniques and he became all right. And for about six, seven months, he was in touch with me. After that, of course, I got busy and I don't know what happened to him. But what I'm telling you is that uh, there are these uh, issues which we have discussed in detail and people should think for themselves. As I told you, know, Hinduism says, think for yourself, take your own decisions, listen to others. And so far as this prescriptive type of uh, religion is concerned, that is not there in Hinduism, I can tell you very clearly. 
but that does not mean that does not make the authority of religion less powerful because without prescription itself there is so much which has been given to us and so much which is so much of experience and so many so many other things that it doesn't weaken the grip of uh, spirituality that's what i would say yeah so now can we begin to wind up yeah, yes of course so, thank you very so much first of all th thank you so first of all let me sort of wrap up very quickly i think it's been very insightful we're going to open up for the audience and we'll be very brief on the audience q a because we know it's very late where you are yeah. Um, and just to sort of let everybody know, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Uh, as you know, uh, there are many, many people who watch these programs who are not subscribed. And that actually just reduces the reach of the programs. Um, as you know, we also are on, on various social media. If you'd like to enroll and, and subscribe to those as well, that would be very, um, very helpful. And as we invite the audience in, and Brother Hashim will share the link right now, or it has been shared. Um, Please be respectful, um, as we always are on this forum, and please stay within the topic that we are discussing today, which is an introduction to Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma, um, and only on the topic that uh, Mr. Dogra has discussed, please. Uh, the, this is a wide and broad and deep topic, and we don't have time today to entertain all of those. So, you know, and hopefully we may have a follow-up session we will obviously have other guests on as well where we can ask some of the more deeper questions for today so please stay on topic thank you sure. so yeah we have put the link uh, in the description of the video and also on the live chat uh, so if you guys want to join the panel and ask mr dogra um, anything that's relevant to the topic will be entertained um, anything that is not uh, unfortunately we, we don't have time for that so, I have an interesting um, question, someone from the chat. I mean, you're more than welcome to totally, you know, demystify that because there seems to be a lot of, uh, you know, confusion on this issue. So this is a question someone's asking. It's not related to this, but it's quite helpful that if you can clarify it. So some people say there is an unspoken mantra when people are dying, they use this mantra or speak this mantra in the ears, very similar to Shahada. It's something like this, La ilha horti papom. Uh, something along this line. What's the basis of this? I think someone's trying I'm to. Not, uh, I'm not aware of that, but uh, whatever you are saying seems to be Bengali, so I don't know whether, whether this has. Uh, I've never heard of that. I've never heard of that. But generally, when a person is dying, uh, generally we read Srimad Bhagavad Gita to him. That's the common practice. But I have not heard of this, so I will not be able Thanks to for clarify. clarify. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So somebody had a question on reincarnation. Maybe just want to yeah. repeat. I think you've already said it, but perhaps just briefly repeat it for them. Do you have How a question works? on the yeah. screen? Um, yeah. Shall I say? Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Reincarnation, you know, reincarnation is that uh, soul does not die. So, we have a soul and we have a body, the body dies. In, Sh in Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavan Sri Krishna says that just as we change a cloth when it becomes old, similarly, the soul changes the body when the body becomes old. So, there is a transition of the soul from one body to another, to another, to another. It goes on and on and on and it has been going on for millions of years. And it continues till the person attains moksha. Okay. That's what is reincarnation. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll get guests so, in, those who are joined. Yeah. So, Arfa, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Your microphone is muted. Okay, let's try someone else. Okay. Uh, hi, my question was uh, primarily about, about uh, the primary scriptures. Uh, you have um, Mahabharata, uh, you know, uh, scripted by Ganesha and dictated by Vyasa. And then you've got Bhagavad Gita, which is Krishna, uh, you know, uh, dictating it, to, you know, basically speaking to Arjuna. And then you have uh, 
uh, Manusmriti, right? You know, uh, Smriti, right? That uh, gets into the very law and jurisprudence of uh, Hinduism. So uh, primarily, right, uh, despite your assertion that uh, Hinduism tends to be very much about personal exploration, it tends to be quite prescriptive. If you look at the 1.8 million words in Mahabharata, they are, they are quite actually prescriptive. Uh, the, first of all, Vyasa described it as itihas, right, history, and not necessarily a religious text per se. And then there are elements of... Uh, uh, obviously, mythology in it, right? For example, uh, the Pandwa brothers are all uh, fathered by different you know, deities. You want to call them avatars or you want to call them gods, right? For example, Arjuna is uh, the son of uh, Indra. And uh, what, what is fascinating here is that Indra is a, a deity that is shared by the Aryans across a large geographical area, including the, the ancient Iranians. So what we have is a very adaptive uh, you know, religion, if you want to call it, right? You, you or a way of life. Now, how do you actually then reconcile it with what you are saying? Uh, that is a personal, uh, you know, exploration. When what we find is that it's very, very prescriptive. In fact, uh, Manuspriti, Manuspriti uh, goes into the details of how the society is actually structured. That's where you have the varnas coming in, and the varnas yeah. are quite specific. They're very adaptive because you mentioned var, right, which is color, but that color was essentially the Aryans who did come into India, uh, they were lighter complexion and completely different features. And when the questions, you know, a Brahmin about what are the characteristics of a Brahmin, the five characteristics he gives, one of them is essentially color, not just knowledge and so on. So you have a very striated society, you know, hereditary hierarchical social organization of the society, which even today persists, you've got 160 million, they're not four varnas. Uh, everyone misses out the fact the fifth, you know, bottom strata of the society are the untouchable today called the leads. Now, how do you reconcile that? Because yes, you are saying it's a personal exploration, but it act has a huge impact on the socioeconomic status of Hindus, right? Uh, you know, the upper caste uh, have 60 percent better, you know, uh, you know, uh, incomes than those who are are the lower, for example, the Shudras, even today, there's a, a huge disparity. So I'm more interested in personal exploration, but for you to explain, A, right, uh, you know, how do you reconcile this uh, discrepancy between personal exploration and prescriptive, literally prescriptive, uh, you know, Hinduism that controls the whole society across the board. And in fact, that control goes all the way across to places like California where they were literally, you know, trying to pressurize the California uh, Department of Education on even the use of the word India and Hindu, when they tried to actually substitute India with South India, because majority of uh, what is Mahabharata actually took place in what is present-day Pakistan. You know, if the, the, if the present political India is not contiguous with the, the ancient India. And the ancient India itself was only the Indus Valley. So if we have a discrepancy there, right? And even in terms of, uh, for example, the capital of Pandwas, you know, they, they regard it as the old Delhi. But in fact, right, as others argue that it is the present day Potwar region of Pakistan. So what, what, what I'm hearing from you is that uh, it's a personal exploration. But what we have from history is that it's a very prescriptive, you know, social system which then bases its uh, prescriptions upon Vedas initially. But, you know, it, there, there is a disconcert, right, over the century, over, over the two and a half millennia almost, that uh, makes it difficult for us to actually get our head around the fact, right, that this is all driven by faith and not necessarily adapted from socioeconomic challenges that, uh, you know, people in this region faced. Okay, shall I respond now? Oh, yes, please, yes. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, Abhiji, I must say you're a very scholarly person and uh, I'm scared of uh, answering you because you know so much. So let me make my humble uh, attempt to answer what you have said. First thing that you are saying is that this is all prescriptive, Manu Smriti is prescriptive and all that. Now, uh, you know, just a moment ago, one of the 
persons on the panel was defining what is prescriptive that it is if it is final it cannot be questioned it cannot be modified it has to be implemented as it is but is manu smriti today implemented as it is i doubt so i don't think it is prescriptive of course you know at that time when he wrote it he was a great philosopher he was a rishi he gave his uh, concepts at that time but those concepts have not been uh, implemented as it is so that's where i would differ with you that uh, it is prescriptive now so far as uh, personal religion is concerned uh, what was the other part of the question i forgot and could you just uh, give me a hint what was uh, your other uh, question i i was uh, specifically was yeah yeah i was referring about, to the fact yeah, about the caste system, system and all that you would say i would say one. yeah i would say you know now coming to that uh, you know all the evils which have arisen you know religion as a philosophy and as a religion is one thing and uh, the activities of people who follow that religion is very different i must uh, with due apology to everybody i must say that the persons who threw the atom bomb in tokyo belonged to a particular religion that does not mean and that's a religion where the uh, son of god gave his life for the people for the sake of others so we cannot uh, assess a religion from the practices of those who uh, claim themselves to be belonging to that particular religion that's point number 2 now coming to personal exploration what happens is you know this is where i want to again bring in shrimad bhagavad gita and in shrimad bhagavad gita is arjun starts raising questions he says this is there that is there he says that uh, the kauravas are fighting with us for the uh, kingdom for getting this kingdom and if i kill my own relatives for the same kingdom then how am i different from them so his question is and he says katham aham bahi bhishmam dronam cha uh issue be pratyutsami how am i going to direct my arrows against bhishma and drone that is his conflict because bhishma and drone only made him archer and now he has to so that's his conflict and that is where bhagwan shri krishna tells him that the universe is huge it's a big system within which your i am showing you only a small portion so if you start deciding the entire uh, issues and defining god and this and this and this and then decide whether to take your action or not then you are not going to be able to do it that's essentially what is the message of shrimad bhagavad gita and that is the message that i take in this huge universe if i start talking about what god eats and uh, what he does and uh, how he does it then i'll be completely lost because the system is so big so what i need to do is with my li- limited capabilities i take a decision okay the decision is that so and so needs my help i should do that for him i should help him so that is where this karma theory becomes important and relevant and personal exploration personal exploration in the sense you know again you are acting you know there are in fact uh, uh, different uh, uh, yoga systems that is uh, gyan yoga karma yoga bhakti yoga so gyan yoga is where you attain knowledge and that way you attain yoga the karma yoga is when you dedicate yourself to action and there are people among muslims i know they have dedicated themselves to action so i would call them karma yogis i had a teacher who was a christian he dedicated himself to teaching all of us i called him karma yogi so karma yoga is there then there is bhakti yoga bhakti yoga is where something like whatever you are describing would be done that is dedicating yourself to to the devotion of a particular deity or godhead and then following him whatever following all his teachings so that is what is bhakti yoga so all these Parts are available. Do I answer your question? 
Your answer is uh, pretty comprehensive, right? But uh, if I may just uh, take an opportunity to draw an analogy. When you refer to the fact that, you know, you do not concern yourself with uh, the nature of uh, God or Creator or Pramatma, that is essentially not different from lots of other faiths and creeds, right? The whole idea that metaphysics, for example, uh, you know, lots of faiths actually do tend to shy away or advise against delving into it. But what, we, what do they not uh, shy away from is actually try, uh, describing the God that they have. So, for example, you know, is, Islam, in Islam, right, there's a very clear description, very short description of uh, God, right? You know, now, similarly, the Christian will give you a very simple, similar description, etc., right, in, the, in Abrahamic faiths. And that's not unique to just the Abrahamic faiths. In fact, it's common to lots of other uh, faiths and creeds, even in the New World, like America's. Now, separating metaphysics from the way of life, what you described as uh, dharma, that's not a in unique either, right? Because in Islam, we have sharia. So it prescribes how you should, you know, the code of what, how you should behave, right? You know, so what's good and what is not acceptable. So those social norms, as you described, thou shalt not kill. That's exactly, thou shalt not kill is not unique to Hinduism. That has Correct. been unique to virtually every faith. Uh, you know, that's what now, you know, that's again, crazy. for example, if you, for example, if you take incest for, and incest again for uh, across cultures has been forbidden. Correct. So uh, I, I would uh, I would uh, say that that's not uh, the unique features or even that relationship that you're trying to seek right towards the you know trying to seek uh, moksha right. What you describe as moksha is trying to get eventually eventually salvation or what yeah. they, it, what, that's what Christians use right in Islam right is important afterlife same thing in christianity and this concept of afterlife is not unique either it, it yeah. has been across the face so what it comes down to is right that uh, i was not trying to you know when when you said right that i was trying to relate it to a person a particular religion that's 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 not the case at all if you see the uh, the dialogue between krishna and uh, you know uh, basically arjuna what is it all about right it's about his moral dilemma and you answered that question quite well, right? That, you know, he's got a moral dilemma. He's in despair about viol uh, violence and death, right? Etc. Because they're fighting their own cousins. When, they, they, you know, Korvas are their own cousins. And, uh, you know, when we when we look at uh, Vyasa, Vyasa doesn't describe it as a religious text. He actually describes it as Itihas, history. So, you know, what we have is, right, that, that this history, the parables are being used to draw a code of life. Now, what we were after in terms of demystifying, you know, we understand that you have got, you know, foundational scriptures, those scriptures that pro provide a context, those scriptures that provide an understanding of the Hindu way of life. But what we have not been able to demystify for ourselves is, and we are still trying to understand, and I think it might be quite useful if we can, uh, uh, you know, request more time from you in future, is we are trying to understand you know, for, for our perspective, the very essence of what you regard as, you, you know, God, as well as what you may actually not necessarily, you know, like, which is perspective religion, but we won't get to the essence of it, that you have a lot of rituals, you know, in yeah. terms of, uh, I, if you yeah. learn and, and so on. So we would like to understand yeah. that, right, in future. So. Yeah. Thank you very much, I, right? I, but, uh, I, 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 sorry. Like to, yeah, I'd, I'd like to just say one word. You see, what happens is, you know, I started by saying that it's like a banyan tree. Hinduism is like a banyan tree. I can only mm -hmm. describe a very small part of it. So that's why I focused on myself as a Hindu rather than talking about Hinduism. You know, so far as this Godhead, etc. concerned, if you go through books like, for example, Shrimad, uh, this uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Srimad Bhagavatam gives you all the definition of Godhead that you are uh, talking about. Then there are Puranas, there are Upanishads. So if one goes through all this, I have gone through some of them during the past one and a half years because of Corona, you know, because I could not move around. So I started focusing on Sanskrit. And I have read a lot of them. They are they contain beautiful poetry, 
very, very clear descriptions. Everything is there. It's not that it's not there. I am focusing here on presenting myself as a Hindu and how I imbibe different things from different scriptures, from different traditions. As I said, I even take from other religions also. I uh, listen to some of the uh, Islamic music. I listen to some of the uh, church, uh, church songs. And I get a lot of religious uh, experiences from them. So it's not, for example, you know, in Pakistan, Abida Begum is there. So I listen to her. That gives me religious experiences. So it's not that uh, we. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to present myself as a Hindu. Thank you very much. Given... Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, Dogra Zab is has been a pleasure, right? And I've loved uh, listening to your perspective on it, right? So I, I better I, hand you I back to your colleagues, you, right? right? And uh, I, I, uh, I respect you. I respect you for all your wisdom, for your uh, broad-mindedness. And uh, I have had great pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thanks Thanks a lot. Thank you, Brother Abid. Right. Right. Could we have just one or two more guests? Because I know it's very late in, in where, yeah. where yeah. Mr. Dogra is right now. So, yeah. Yeah. Guys, try to keep it brief, inshallah. Yes. Yeah. yes. yes. Brother MFE. Assalamu alaikum. How are you guys? Assalamu uh, hi, welcome to the guest, uh, Brother Satish. So uh, I'm going to keep the question very short, as Hashim said. Um, I might have missed it during the mainstream, but does the concept of heaven and hell uh, exist within Hinduism? Because uh, for us as Muslims, we, we live our lives um, as best we can and be guided by our scripture. And our aspiration is to attain heaven and to avoid hellfire. So I know in the beginning you mentioned that um, you merge. So, so after the whole process of birth and death and birth and death, you eventually merge with the eternal soul. Um, is that equivalent to attaining heaven? No. And also is no. No, 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 no. Heaven and hell, heaven and hell are described in uh, some of the text, texts, Srimad Bhagavatam, for example, describes heaven and hell and the punishments and all those things. So I didn't touch upon them because, as I said, you know, I have been trying to present myself and what I have integrated from different uh, scriptures. So there definitely is. And moksha is not heaven. Moksha is that state in which you become a part of Paramatma. You go and merge with Paramatma. After that, heaven, hell, and everything become meaningless because then you are in a very different state of uh, existence. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yeah, it does. It does. Thank you. I'm, okay. I actually have another question, but I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to... Yeah, yeah, thank you. Let's leave it to one. Thank you. 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 Next guest, please. Okay, right. Hesh Bond. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, Hashim. Uh, yes. That's a question to I'm me. Sorry, brother. You have a lot of lot of interference on your line. Do you have any question for Mr. Dobra? Related to the topic. The subject. Yeah. Uh, no, no. I just joined now, and if I want to ask Mr. Hashim. Okay, perhaps, you, perhaps you another time because yeah, we, perhaps we are, another time, brother. Yeah. Because we already addressed the email to Mr. Dobra. Right, okay. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, but, I think uh, that's all we have uh, because the other person hasn't connected his mic. So, is there anyone um, in the comments? From section? the chat, there was a common theme of the same question. I think which I alluded to earlier: like, how does a an animal attain uh, to come to rebirth into a human form? What do they have to do? It's repeatedly yeah. being asked in the chat. I think yeah. you already asked that earlier, isn't it? Yeah, we answered it earlier, so we can leave that till next yeah. time. Because I think yeah. this, this, it's I something it's, that, uh, that brought... Past that, midnight already, so I think we should yeah. give... The Mr. Uh, so just Mr. for the Dogra audience, break. Mr. Dogra already explained this very clearly, that this is something yeah. that he doesn't spend his uh, intellectual energy on because he's more focused on his own search. 
and his yeah. own search is actually more important to him than than spending energies on the, these thoughts so uh, okay. this is the answer so please you know be, be respectful of that maybe this can be the last question and then we can give mr dogra a break to let him go to sleep inshallah it's past midnight over there thank you very much really appreciate your effort so do you see the question on the screen mr dogra it says what a person needs to do to become a brahmin especially sudra so i think his or her question is it yeah it's can someone from one varna change to another from a brahmin to a shudra or shudra to shatri or something like that see the initially there was uh, these divisions were based on the type of your actions if your actions are good you were treated as a brahmin if your actions were bad you could be treated as a shudra that's how it used to be initially then as i said you know a rigidity came and that came primarily because of invasions from outside and because of forced conversions so the concept of untouchability entered at the time because the leaders of the community thought that the only way of preventing conversion is to treat everyone who converts as an untouchable so that he is cut off from the society ostracized and that is how it was done and then it became a practice and it has become a bad practice now so far as uh, moving up the ladder is concerned there is a concept given by one mn shrinivasan the concept is sensitization so he showed how in today's society because of the mobility people keep moving from one ladder to another they shift to another place where the people where others do not know what is their caste what is their origin and all that you know these are all some of the uh, problems which are related to human psychology you know people would like to uh, treat others as inferior to themselves so it's not just a religious problem it's a human problem which exists everywhere so you know people who are of a particular complexion they would like to join together and treat people of other other complexion as inferior we know so much about racism and so these are all problems which ultimately have to be handled at multiple levels we we cannot treat them as religious problems so much that's how i would uh, feel about it okay it seems like uh, when you said that it depends on the action yeah but there has been a lot of mobility in indian society and especially because of the reservations now the entire thing is changing so no, no, what i meant is uh, you know when you said that if you if if you if your actions are good you will be a brahmin and if the actions are bad you will be a shudra it seems like a shudra is a form of punishment rather than a classification or division of labor from what you said no no what what i'm saying is you know if we talk of the initial stage when this was defined at that time this division was according to the quality you know there are three types of uh, there are three categories of acts or nature also everything is in fact classified in three ways that is satoguni rajoguni tamoguni these are the three gunas or qualities of behavior of nature of acts of food etc so those people who have tamo uh, who have uh, satogun they were treated as the brahmins or they would become the brahmins because they would not they would be mostly uh, involved in meditation teaching and uh, religious activities then there were rajoguni people and you know the satoguni people would not uh, take uh, drinks and meat and uh, those things then there were rajoguni people who would be taking drinks and meat and their uh, nature would be slightly rough type they would have a little bit of violence so like that you know then there is the tamoguni pravritti so these divisions were there at that time and okay, so during those days we so sorry, sorry to interrupt i just um, want to get my head around this so is it correct that one of the um, what he says shlokas or the verses in the manusmriti or i think it's in the gita or somewhere where it says that the shudras are basically to serve the other three 
the other three classes? I, I, I'll have to locate that. I'm not sure of that. Okay, that's because, that's fine. No you problem. know, one one thing I would one thing I would say to you as mm -hmm. when I said that I talk about my uh, religion. What how I feel is you know let's say there is a huge tree which has been in existence for five thousand years, and that tree has undergone a lot of changes over the time. And there is a lot of fruit which is uh, which has fallen from that tree. It is for me to decide whether I want to pick up the rotten and venomous fruit or I want to pick up the good fruit, eat it and become healthy. So that's how when I say again and again that I choose whatever is the best, even if it is in some other scripture, I don't mind. Supposing there is something, you know, in fact, uh, uh, I told you I used to go and uh, uh, participate in functions in mosques and uh, schools, colleges, etc. So whatever I found good there, I picked that up. I integrated it with my lifestyle. So I don't have to put a stamp and say this has come from so and so. This has come from so and so. You know, for example, what happens is without mentioning a religion, sometimes what happens is supposing we have done a puja and we offer prasad to somebody. A person from another religion would say, I don't take prasad because I'm prohibited from taking it. So I won't do that if there is, for example, you know, if there is something, some function somewhere like, you know, I was SP in Madurai in 1988. There was one Muslim person about in his 60s. So every Eid, he used to bring a big dabba, big, uh, you know, what is it called? Mm -hmm. Container. Yeah, container container of uh, I don't take non-veg so first time he brought chicken curry then I told him I don't not take non-veg he took everything back again came back he used to come on a scooter he would never come for anything else you know he would never come for an obligation he would not care he would only come on Eid would bring a big container all my drivers orderlies everybody would have a good sumptuous feast so <laughs> I have been interacting with people like this and uh, as I told you, you know, I have fought with Muslims, I have fought for Muslims. So there were occasions when Muslims were under attack, I stood by their side. They went there, and there have been so many Muslims, I tell you, you know, they have taken uh, risk of their life and stood by my side. I am very grateful to them. There, are, there have been gems of people. So I go by the person, not by his stamp. So. I, I think uh, you would understand my religion and this religion has come from my scriptures, from my gurus, from my parents and it has taught me to value a person for what he is and not for and that was what I, what I used to say when I was in service, you know, somebody would come and say that this person has been attacked, this, that. And I would say, what is this? You know, if a person is wearing a cross, he's a Christian. If he's wearing Om, he's a Hindu. If he's wearing something else, he's a Muslim. So Islam is not, or the Christianity is not a cross alone. You know, there is so much else. So we should not reduce a religion to just one small symbol or a name or something like that. You know, when I was a small child, when I was a child, you know, for nearly 10 years, my mother, because I'm from Punjab, so they had come from Pakistan and uh, after division also, you know, lots of influence was there. There was one place which was the Mazar of a Peer, Peer Ka Mazar. So my mother had told me to go and light a lamp on it every Thursday. So for nearly 10 years as a child, every Thursday I used to go. My mother said, if you light a lamp there, you will get good education. So who knows, maybe I became a police officer because of the blessings of that peer. <laughs> I accept that. Yes. I, it doesn't It doesn't at all make me uncomfortable to say that it might have been a Muslim whose blessings gave me all this. So that's my religion. Sure. Very open. It's been mm -hmm. a pleasure listening to you and learning about what exactly is Shanatan Dharma from from your own perspective, rather than you know people trying to understand from externally, so this is yeah. one of the aims um, of our show today to bring one of the adherents of the faith 
um, and to explain to our audience what exactly this entails and, and, and this belief system is. So I hope um, in this brief session today, our audience have enjoyed listening to Mr. Dogra, have understood and the key concepts of Sanatan Dharma, Hinduism, uh, you know, known as incorrectly. So things like, I would like you to go, if you want to learn a bit more about it, research on the Dharma and Karma, these key terms, on Prakriti and Purushaha, if you talked about Gyan or, or this idea of knowledge with a capital K and the concept of how truth is essentially very complex and the only way you can achieve is not through your senses, but you have to follow this certain path or a way. And uh, Samadhi, I think you mentioned one of the ways is meditation and various others. So there seems to be a, a system uh, based around uh, this whole way of life, as you described. And it is not as many people have taken into account, you know, Hindus are the ones who worship a cow. I mean, of course, one of the questions would have been like this, you know, you're a cow worshiper and so on. But rather, it, it has a deeper, uh, you know, philosophical underpinnings within it. So those of you who are interested, of course, um, you know, you can go and research more about it. But I, would not, I don't want to keep you any longer uh, in your you know, regular schedule. So we appreciate once again to coming to Dawa Wise and explaining to us about Sanatan Dharma. And and also the audience who have participated and, and apologies for all the questions that were coming through in your chat. If we had a longer time and a different time zone, then we would have probably entertained all of these questions. Maybe this, maybe in another future time. So thank you very much, Mr. Dogra. And I must, anything else I must, uh, like I must add, thank all of you. I must thank all of you. It has been a very pleasant experience for me. And uh, you have all been extremely decent. Your uh, audience have also been very decent. So it has been a very great experience for me. Thanks a lot. Oh, it's, it's I a pleasure indeed. I mean, you, you stayed up so late for us, so it's a real honor and a pleasure to be uh, sharing the panel with you. But uh, hopefully this will be a starting point uh, to discuss more topics on sure. Hinduism. Maybe we'll sure. have more guests. So if there are Hindus uh, are listening out there, and if you guys are willing to come on our show uh, as a panel member and discuss the faith, like uh, Brother Mansur, Ustad Mansur said at the beginning, this is and this is really for us to get to know each other because there's been a lot of, what do you say, misunderstanding and a lot of mistrust because of that. So we want to understand each other and the only, uh, I would say the best way to do that is to communicate with each other. Yes, with honesty, with integrity and with respect. So inshallah, uh, God willing, we will have another show uh, on Hinduism in the future. So if there are any other uh, any other people out there that you are acquainted with who might benefit this particular topic, we are looking for people who are practicing Hindus. Well, obviously, like uh, Stad Mansur said, we don't want somebody uh, to, uh, to, to represent uh, who is not from that faith because we wouldn't want that of our faith, somebody speaking on behalf of us. So we would uh, like to obviously see the same from the other side as well. So thank you very much without taking any more time. to Jazakallah khair. Brother Muhammad, you got any last words before we there, close? There's nothing, there's nothing more I can add. And I think I would just say again to Mr. Dogra, it's been an absolute pleasure sharing the stage with you. And I think uh, now that thanks, we've got to know you, you, now that we've got to know you, we, yeah. we, we, we know you. So uh, we look forward to uh, um, benefiting more from your insights because I know there is so much more sure. you can share. Uh, we have only just sure. scraped the surface here today. Only just Absolutely. scraped. So thank you so much. Sure. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank okay. So with that further ado, let's close this uh, meeting. Inshallah. Subhanakallah. Wa bihamdik. Ashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Wa astaghfiru wa tubi laik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.